Um, okay, so in this uh, video, I'm going to start to our second chapter, uh, Monopoly Behavior. Uh, there are two important topics that we need to talk about. Uh, the first one is more important than the other one, to be honest. Price discrimination and monopolistically competitive markets. So in this video, um, <clears throat> I'm going to briefly describe each uh, topics and then I will dive uh, deeper into the price discrimination and, and sort of uh, how we so, sort of solve them through examples in my uh, next videos. All right, so if you remember the last chapter, I mean the first chapter and the last video, uh, we mentioned the monopolist is inefficient uh, because the monopolist is trying to maximize its profit, but because the uniform pricing is, is, is imposing a constraint uh, that the monopolist has to leave some deadweight loss meaning some surplus which is unconsumed by the producer itself, I mean the monopolist itself, and the consumer. So the monopolist can actually extract that surplus as a profit through what we call price discrimination, meaning the monopolist, uh, by charging different prices to different customers, can extract that surplus. All right. So what we will do in this chapter, therefore, we're going to relax this assumption, the standard monopoly assumption, uniform pricing and see what happens if the monopolist charges uh, different prices to different customers. Obviously, there are a lot of questions one may ask is like, well, the, the, the monopolist is going to price discriminate. How um, can, can the monopolist charge different prices for every single customer? So that's why basically we have three uh, sort of main price discrimination methods. The first degree price discrimination, second degree and third degree price discrimination. So the first degree price discrimination is the monopolist can charge different prices to different customers. So every customer pays different amount of money. That's the idea. And it's possible only if the monopolist can actually know the consumer's willingness to pay. Price discriminating uh, on the basis of, uh, I don't know, sex, uh, race, gender, uh, you know, those kind of uh, discrimination. Well, first off, it's not really legal and I think it's offensive. But the, 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 the price discrimination on those venues uh, does not make sense. The monopolist should be price discriminate given that the consumer's willingness to pay are different, right? If there are two customers, who are willing to pay for the same product exactly the same amount of money. There is no point of price discriminating these customers. All right. So, however, if two customers are having two different willingness to pay, one is willing to pay higher than the other one, let's say, well, the monopolist should charge the guy who is willing to pay more higher price. All right. So that's the idea. So in the first degree price discrimination, the monopolist can actually extract the whole surplus from the customers. So as I said, I'm going to dive into details in the following videos. In the second degree price discrimination, the monopolist um, cannot really distinguish uh, which buyer is, is, is which, and they can't, uh, the, the monopolist can't really distinguish which buyer has higher or lower willingness to pay. However, the monopolist knows that some customers have higher and some customers have lower willingness to pay. And the monopolist also knows that the customer's willingness to pay for quality or quantity may be different than the others. All right. So, for example, some customers are willing to pay more for higher quality than some other customers. So what the monopolist then can do is to product differentiate in a sense. It's like offer two different qualities, high quality, low quality and charge different prices. So here, for the first time, we have a monopoly offering two different products, not just one product, but two different products. So the high willingness to pay customers go for the high quality and the low willingness to pay customers go for the low quality, all right? And so the monopolist can extract more surplus from the customers in that way. Or it doesn't have to be quanti uh, quality, but quantity, for example. Say I need a marker, um, a seller can actually sell one marker 
or it can sell a pack of markers, which includes, say, 12 of those. All right. Well, obviously, if the monopolists sell one at a price a dollar, uh, a 12 pack is going to sell, for example, I don't know, 60 cents per marker. So the total price will obviously be higher, but per item price will be lower. So the question is, if I'm a customer who is willing to buy and need only just one marker, so what am I going to do with the remaining 11 markers? So I may just go for this one marker. On the other hand, a customer who says, oh, you know what, I'm buying those markers for the long term. All right, so I will use them eventually. So let me go and grab the 12 of those, although I pay more, uh, per item price is lower. So you can sell basically different products to different customers and extract more surplus from the customers. All those strategies actually reduces the dead weight loss and increases the producer surplus. While the third degree price discrimination, there is no two product, there's only one product, but the thing and you cannot, as in the case of first degree price discrimination, you cannot distinguish the customers like, oh, is the customer A has higher willingness to pay or lower willingness to pay? So you can't know that, let's suppose. However, you can group the customers in a way that a group, one group has a higher willingness to pay than the other group. For example, student versus non-students, all right? Or students versus seniors versus non-seniors and non-students. So if you're a student, the movie ticket is probably cheaper. If you're not a student, it probably it's more expensive. The idea is that, well, if it is a student group, um, a customer is in the student group, probably his or her willingness to pay is lower than the other customers, all right? And while well, the thing is that, though, um, you should be able to verify from which group each customer is. And that's sometimes easy. You can just ask for student ID. So if, if the customer can show the student ID, well, you can basically say, oh, here's the product, the same product, but here's your price. And if, he, if the customer cannot show the student ID, oh, here's the same product, but that is your uh, different price. All right, so that's the idea of third degree price discrimination. As I said, I'm gonna dive into details with numerical examples in the next videos. So finally, uh, let me talk about monopolistically competitive markets. There's not much to say about it. And so I wanted to squeeze it in, 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 in this video. So it sounds a bit, uh, you know, awkward that monopoly and competitiveness is, is in the same um, sort of uh, sentence, monopolistically competitive market. I mean, make your decision. Are you monopoly or competitive? So it can be both, actually. And in most of the real world uh, uh, markets are actually quite monopolistically competitive. So the market is competitive, meaning there are many sellers. However, each seller has some um, monopoly power. Remember the term that we defined in, the, in, in, in one of the previous videos? Meaning, for some group of customers, I can actually charge my price as I wish. Um, the, the good that I'm selling, the, the reason is, the good that I'm selling is somewhat different than the, 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 the goods that the other sellers are selling. So we're not selling exactly the same goods. So the product differentiation is the key word in monopolistically competitive market. I mean, imagine if we both, I mean, if we all sell the same product, monopolistically competitive market is oxymoron. I mean, it can't happen, right? So there, there must be a way that I distinguish my service, my product. Automobile markets, all right? So they're car producers and sellers, but each one of them is selling different cars, different models, different colors, right? So Honda, Hyundai, BMW, Mercedes, they all are car, but you know, the quantity-wise, quality-wise, they all are different. Even within the same uh, company, they offer different uh, varieties, right? So what happens is that as you change the product, some people go for, say, BMW. They don't want to buy something else. Some people go for Mercedes. Some people go for Hyundai. All right. So within, so 
in, in the larger uh, market environment, the, 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 the demand, there's a specific group of customers that are willing to buy my product. Obviously, if I exaggerate my price, I will probably lose those customers, but nevertheless, I'm not as powerless as a perfectly competitive firm. I can still decide and choose my price. So I am facing a downward sloping demand curve within this group of customers, all right? However, as I said, I am nevertheless still competing with other uh, sellers like the Hyundai is competing with Honda and competing with BMW or whatever. All right. So um, as I said, I'm facing a, a downward sloping demand curve, which is just part of the or subclass of the total market demand curve. And we are competing with each other. What happens or the key takeaway from monopolistically competitive market is that in the long run, whether there's entry or exit matters, very much like the perfectly competitive market. In the long run, if there's free entry and exit, which is what we assume in a monopolistically competitive market, I mean, everyone, those investors, can come up with a, a new brand of car and they can produce their own cars, all right? So there's no boundary for this, let's suppose. If there is a free entry and an exit in the long run, each firm in the monopolistically competitive market is going to get zero profit, zero economic profit. All right. So basically, that's that's the main takeaway from monopolistically competitive markets. So what I'm going to do in the next videos, I'll talk about first, second and third degree price discrimination. I'll first cover the first and third and then the finally second degree price discrimination because it's relatively more complicated, all right?